episode number 56. When I shifted my mind a little bit to think about how do I, how can I help people? What do they need? It made it a little bit, I would say it made it easier to keep going. This episode is brought to you by The Collective, which is our monthly membership community for ambitious women who want to continue to build their careers whilst raising a family. Now, once you've had a baby, things might change for you. Once you become a mum, you might be thinking differently about your career and negotiating what you want can be tough. So within this community, we help you to figure out where you want to go with your career and how you could get there. So whether you are switching direction, whether you want to build on what you've already developed in your career thus far, whether you want to launch your own business, we are there to support you step by step, providing the tools, the guidance, the coaching and the community that you need to move boldly towards the career that you want. So if you're interested in joining an awesome group of women as you navigate the highs and lows of your career beyond motherhood, then head over to lightboxcoaching.com forward slash collective hyphen waitlist and get your name on the list so that I can let you know when the doors will be opening again. We would love to have you join us. Hi, you're listening to the Careers Beyond Motherhood podcast with your host, Janine Esbrand. I'm here to help working mums like you to thrive in your careers and in motherhood. I share tips, strategies and inspirational conversations with awesome women to help reduce the struggle in your juggle. Hello and welcome to the show. As always, I'm excited to be here with you today. Last week was such a crazy week. Everybody was getting over illness in our house and things just seemed to be a bit crazy. I'm experiencing a transition for sure in my children, both of them. So my daughter is one and a half. Um, she's going to be two in June and my son is three and a half he's going to be four in May and I'm seeing them both change slightly and recognizing that the way that we're communicating with both of them and what we're doing needs to change a little bit because they're clearly growing going through those transitions where they're exerting their independence and are not afraid to let us know when they're not happy about what we say or what they are asked to do so it's an interesting time in our house and and I have been reflecting on the importance of communication and adjusting your communication depending on who you're speaking to and what it is you want them to do. So that feeds very well into the conversation that I had with our guest because we talk about communication and how important it is in the context of emails in the context of communicating with people in a corporate setting but also in a business setting and using email in an effective way. Now we all know we get a ton of email in our inboxes and some of those emails we click and open and others we look over and ignore. So we're going to be looking at that today and looking at ways that you can make sure that your email communication is effective. So whether you are a business owner who is using email as part of your marketing strategy or if you are in a corporate setting and you use email to communicate with your colleagues, the tips you're going to learn in today's episodes are so, so useful. I'm going to be interviewing a lovely lady called Maggie Frank Shu. She is an email marketing specialist and she is also one of my friends and mastermind buddies. I met her in person in Miami and she is amazing. So if you haven't listened to episode 54 of the podcast where I talk about um, the mastermind that I am a part of and the trip to Miami that I had recently where I got a chance to meet Maggie and the other amazing ladies, then do go and listen to that episode. Maggie is so, so down to earth. She is the real deal. She's really smart. She's awesome and a whiz with email. So I am really excited to have her on the show and have her sharing some of her golden nuggets with you so that you can be moving forward with your communication in a more effective and impactful way. Without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please, could you introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a bit about you? Hey, Janine. Okay. Uh, so I'm Maggie Frank Shu. I am the owner of MFH Consulting. I do email marketing for mom business owners specifically. And I could talk why, about a little bit more about why it's moms, but I live in San Diego, California. I have two kids. I've been in business for about three years and I'm a writer by trade. So I started out as a writer. 
What else do you want to know? That's fine because I'm going to dig in and ask you more questions so you can tell us more about you from the answers that you give. Okay. Um, so can you just tell me a bit about what life looked like before you became a mom? So what did your career look like before? You said now you're a business owner. So what were you yeah. doing pre-babies? Yeah, I graduated university, as you guys say, at 22. And then I basically went from job to job. So when I graduated, I was really... I didn't know what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be in university for another year at least. I remember being really terrified. I had no, I didn't have like a clear direction. I'd, I'd always been really good at school and I had, I had the whole school game figured out. <laughs> and so I just wanted to stay because I was good <laughs> at that. And, but I didn't obviously. And uh, I got a job kind of doing nothing in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, sorry to those people. I'm sure they're not listening, but uh, I really didn't do much. It was one of those jobs. I don't know if these exist anymore, but it was like, you could just sort of, they didn't really, I didn't have anything to do. And so um, I was doing, I was writing and I was blogging a little bit. And anyway, eventually I, I got a job down there at a newspaper because I had worked at the newspaper in college and I knew mm -hmm. I was a good writer. And so that was, uh, that was kind of the direction I took, but it wasn't really like, I didn't, kind of graduate college and go, I'm going to be the next, you know, great reporter. But yeah, I got a job at a newspaper and I learned a lot at that newspaper because there were deadlines and there was kind of excitement and community. And I really loved that environment. And that's how I decided that I wanted to stay in journalism. So and then I, I got my master's at Columbia School of Journalism in New York. So I moved to New York. I got jobs at various magazines in New York as a research editor and copy editor and um, that probably went on for about five years. And then I kind of wanted something more. I didn't really see how it was going to move up in journalism. And print journalism seemed like it was collapsing, like there were fewer jobs, especially in mm. New York. So I started looking around and there was a job to do some content writing and editing at Startup. So in still in New York. So and I got the job and that was, I loved startup culture. That was a real startup. You know, they had like their, I don't know all the lingo, but they had like their series A round or whatever. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and the idea is it's how cast, I don't know if they still exist, but they, it was kind of like a weird time. It was like 2008. And so, I mean, the idea, I guess, was to, be, it's kind of, yeah, the idea was to compete with YouTube, but only do how to, but it didn't, I don't know, that idea sounds ludicrous now, but back then it didn't sound so crazy. But um, <laughs> so we were doing how to videos and we were doing, there was a lot, but there was a lot of experimentation with content there, which was really fun, especially because they were videos. So there was like, they were bringing in a lot of, and it's New York. So they were bringing in a lot of like young creative filmmakers and just doing all kinds of interesting things. And I was working on, the scripts. So mm. I did that. For, I, I loved that. I found that like, um, I really loved, it was like a time in my life where I wanted to be around certain type of people and I didn't really care what the job was. Although, you know, it was always writing and editing for me. So, um, but I learned a little bit about audience building too, because that was really important to them. They wanted eyeballs, you know, the more they could prove that people wanted this, the more they could go for an, a next series of funding. Yeah. So, so that was where I started to learn a little bit about marketing. And, uh, and I got laid off in 2011. And then I got other jobs, basically, uh, still in New York, I bounced around, really leaned on the fact that I had experience on the web. So I got web content jobs. I got all kinds, I got like sort of pseudo project management jobs. <laughs> and then finally, I landed at this nonprofit where we built like a really robust and exciting website specifically for parents of children who have learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and it was like a site with a million views a month. And I was in charge of all social media for that. And that's where I really, I learned a lot about marketing there and a lot about all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. And so that sort of leads up to, we moved to San Diego when I was 30 weeks pregnant with my first son and I kept my job at that nonprofit. And then um, I was working remotely and traveling to New York every three months or so. And it was a really good situation. I had no complaints. I had a good salary. And then I just, and I was just, wasn't, it was almost like I was 22 again in university. And I was like, okay, I know how to do all this stuff. But instead of wanting to stay there, I was just kind of like, mm, I don't like, I could just do this or not do this, but I don't really see, I don't see where yeah. this is going and I don't see how I'm going to grow from this. And so, that's when I, it was about a year later, year after we moved here, 
I decided to quit my job and start my own business. Awesome. Yeah. And do you think it was something to do with becoming a mom that was that catalyst for saying I want to do more than what I'm doing now? Yeah, it's funny. So I'm, yes. So I've done some deep thinking about this because I hired a woman who I can plug her. Her name's Anna Lehman if people want to look her up, but she kind of gets you to think about why you're doing what you're doing and to, to talk about it and write it down. So it's uh, hopefully by the time you post this podcast, my website copy will be completely redone, but yes, it's deeply connected. Not to say, you know, so a lot, I know a lot of entrepreneurs after they became mothers, they say they did it because they wanted like a more flexible schedule or situation. But for me, I actually did it because when I had my son, it was like a huge, like, like (laughs) so hard. And it was so like, you know, you know, theoretically what that will be like, but I just, my life was not my own anymore. And, and then my job was kind of like that too. Like, even though, I mean, I said like, it was, it was a good situation. I really liked kind of not having to go in the office every day because, uh, that off, like before I had kids, it was really good and matched with my personality, but everybody in there was very type A, even though it was a nonprofit, it was a very well-funded nonprofit. And, you know, it was kind of fancy office and everyone was, I mean, yeah, I would call them type A, <laughs> like really like just go, go, go. And there were lots of meetings and people were always late for things. And it was just kind of that situation where, you know, it, it was like, yeah, I don't know. Everybody was just sort of striving. And um, that was, I kind of felt like there were a lot of demands on me in that way, even though I was working remotely. So like my whole day was just about like, what does everybody want? What does other people, what do, what does this person want? What does my son want? You know, and what do, everything was about what somebody, like helping somebody else move mm. forward. And that's what I really landed on. That's what I realized. I didn't realize it until just a couple of months ago when I sat down and thought about, well, why did I quit my job? But it really was just kind of like, you know, and I was pumping that whole, that whole first year. And um, gosh, I mean, you know, so it was just kind of like, everything was about like, it really like pumping, you know, it was just, everything was about like giving my resources, uh, getting rid of my resources and giving them to somebody else all day long. Yeah. And so, yes, I think definitely that worked. So doing, working a job like that before I had a baby worked because I still had all this time to myself in the evenings and on the weekends, you know, unless my job led in to that. But yeah, after I had him, it was like, I was really losing my sense of myself. And I was really, it wasn't just about being tired and stuff. It was like, I just felt like I, I don't know. I was like, I was getting erased or something. It was really deep, like really bad. Mm. (laughs) And so that's why, you know, even though it was a good, like I said, it was a good steady job. It wasn't, it wasn't anybody's fault, but it was like, yeah, definitely, definitely had a lot to do with having him. And I realized all along, you know, at that point I was 35 or so that, so that for that 13 years, since I'd graduated university, I hadn't really taken the bull by the horns. Like I hadn't been like, this is who I am. This is this is my goal with my career. Even though I was very driven and I worked very hard, I wasn't like, I, I wasn't like, so, uh, you know, I'm sure this resonates with you, Janine. I bet you talk to a lot of women like this, but I wasn't like, yeah, I want to be, I want to make this much money or I want to be this yeah. type of person. I had nothing in mind. And so things kind of came to me, but I wasn't advancing. I, ha- I hadn't ever had a managerial role, even though I'd had like really key roles at companies. So I didn't get recognition. I didn't have a chance to get promoted and things like that really ate at me. Tired of waiting around to have someone else decide to, to make that happen for me. So I was like, well, if I start a business, I can just charge more. I mean, it's easier said than done, but you know, when yeah. you cut your teeth, you charge more, you know, you get higher quality clients. That's how you move up. And that's all dependent on you and the kind of risks you're willing to take and stuff like that. So although I didn't know that at the time when I first started my, my business, but I just kind of had, it's weird because I'm not a person who follows my intuition, but it was a point in my life too, where it felt like it was going to be okay if I didn't make money right away. So, Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I wasn't going to like, we were going to be on the street if I quit my job and didn't have a clear sense of what I was doing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I just like, yeah. Anyway, sorry. It's okay. Got off on the tangent. I think just what you're saying, people will definitely resonate with that whole piece of feeling like you 
almost lose yourself trying to figure out, well, who am I now? Like, yes, I am so-and-so's mom, but before that I was so much more. And now where do I go? What do I do? So a lot of people face that almost like identity crisis, even if they did know what they wanted to do before, there always seems to be that wobble where people are like, what do I do? And if you're in a space where you are not quite sure what you want life to look like anyway, and then you become a mom, then it it makes it even worse. So you can easily go down that spiral of, I just don't know. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think a lot of people have had that experience and then it does take some time and reflection and some thinking to figure out like, okay, who am I now? And where do I want to go now? Yeah. But in terms of you and then like shifting into your business, how did you, how did you find that transition? Because going from being an employee to being a business owner isn't an easy transition. Like people tend to say, you know, go out on your own and just, you can do whatever you want, but actually getting started isn't as easy as people make out. So um, talk to us a bit about whether there were any challenges for you or like how you felt when you first got going. Yeah. It was like all one big challenge. I mean, it was like really hard. Uh, it's still hard. It's still very hard. Um, <laughs> but I think the transition itself was very hard. Where my mind was at, it's, it's really hard. Actually, I don't know if it's like a type of person, but even if you crave like being in charge of yourself, being your own boss, when you get that, it's really hard if you're used to somebody else telling you what to do with your time. Yeah. And so that was really hard. I didn't know what to do. And I was, I'm very risk averse. I'm getting less so now, but everything in business requires a risk. Like you, if you're going to take an action, call a person on the phone, pitch somebody, you risk getting said no to, which is hard at first, you know, like, so because I didn't want anything to do anything risky, I barely did anything at first. You know? I, had, I quit when I quit. I had one client, and uh, but that was not like a bill pay. Like that was not a bill paying contract. Uh, I mean, it was yeah. just a thing. So figuring out. So I just I don't know. I started talking to people. I joined joined a co working space. So I got a couple clients that way. Like pe- first, I started with social media because that was what I had been doing. So social media management, I guess is what I was trying to do. Mm. And so like not ads, but just managing your social presence. And I wanted to do content because that's what I knew, but it wasn't, I didn't know how to sell myself. I mean, it was a very difficult transition. What else do you want to know? No, it <laughs> just, it, yeah. I think it's just, it's, it, it's good to speak to people who are, are open and transparent about the challenges. Cause sometimes it can seem rosy you know like I speak to people who say okay I don't want to go back to my job so I'm just going to start my own business and that's great but it's just educating people to realize that it's not necessarily the easy option it's another option but it isn't the easy option and so it's good to hear you know behind the scenes and 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 what it really looks like for people um who are in different industries that's such a good point it's like I I do think part of me was like well so part of me was I mean the big catalyst was I have to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. Like I just, I, I can't live my life. That was another thing kind of tied to my son. I want my son to watch as he's growing up. And now I have two as they're growing up to watch me do like crush it, do something really. Mm. And that wasn't happening. And so that was really important to me. But on another level, you know, it did seem kind of, it sounded sort of safer or something. It's like, well, I'll just like be on my own and, you know, and, and then I don't have to, deal with, you know, my boss and, right. you know, whatever, and getting somewhere at a certain time every day, <laughs> you know, but yeah, those are, those are benefits, I guess, but they, you know, they come with all kinds of challenges. And the other thing I was going to say is what, when my business started actually accelerating and getting more fun to be in and making more money was when I shifted from, you know, well, I want this and I want that to, what do, what do I do for people that they need, (laughs) you know, and like being able to, then that's why I switched to email because email was, when I learned email marketing, I already had the contact that content background. And when I learned strategy, it was like, Oh, so many people need this. Like people started making more money in their businesses as a direct result of working with me. And then it was, that was easier to sell. It wasn't like, Oh, well with social media, it was like, well, well, you know, you'll just be producing content more, more yes. uh, consistently. And this was like, oh no, I'm making money for people. Like, yeah. and that was a lot easier of a sell. So when I shifted my mind a little bit to think about how do I, how can I help people? What do they need? 
it made it a little bit, I would say it made it easier to keep going. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I think that that approach applies in so many different ways. So I was actually working with a client yesterday. She's making like a flexible working request. So she wants to go back to work after maternity leave and she wants to do so on a flexible basis. So when we were talking about how she should approach her request, I was saying like, you need to first think about what value you add to the team. So instead of going in and being like, oh, I want to work flexibly because that works for me and my family, you're more saying, well, this is the value that I add. This is how I see it working. This is how I I want to show you that you need me so that you're going to say yes to the request. Um, yeah. And it was a complete shift of thinking for her. And I think it, it applies in that respect. And then again, like you said, in business, it's how are you serving the people and, and how can you communicate to them that they need what what you have so I think it's an amazing um, shift of perspective that we could all apply depending on you know regardless of which area it is that we're working and operating I know that's such a good point Judy I just saw I happened on I was like on ink.com or something and I happened on this Tim Ferriss video and Tim Ferriss like like you know is up and down for me with the things he says and thinks but this, like, he's really smart about certain things. And he's that he said, the question was like, he was answering a question. What do you, how do you convince your boss that like, it doesn't matter if you're in the office or not, as long as you get work done. And he was like, well, you have to start work. You have to work for like, this was what he suggested work from home on Saturday for like eight Saturdays, which sounds terrible. Right. Mm-hmm. And then document that you actually get the same amount or more done or whatever, yes. you know, and then, and then like show your boss the charts. And like make a presentation, make a PowerPoint. It's like a lot of people won't actually put in that work. That's yeah. a lot of work, right? Yeah. A lot of people are just like, well, I'm sure it's better or it's the same, you know? And it's like, no, you actually have to, from your boss's perspective, you have to, you have to show. Cause bring like, the, the, bring the data. That, yeah. And the act of doing that, the fact that you were conscientious enough to do that shows that you probably won't like watch Netflix all day when you find yeah. it. So it's just like, that's hard. So everything you're right. Like starting your own business hard, like getting what you want in, in a corporate setting hard. <laughs> like there's no, yes. it's not like one of them, you need to jump to one of them because one of them's easier. It's just kind of like, what is, yeah. Anyway, so totally agree with you. And I think that it kind of goes to the, the whole piece about communication, which we're going to talk about in terms of email in that it's all about effectively communicating to people and knowing what it is you need to say and when you need to say it to essentially yeah. get to where you want to get to. I think a lot of us don't think enough about how how we're expressing what it is that we want um, beforehand. And so I'm really interested for you to share a bit more about how we can be more effective in our email communication because we all email. So whether you're emailing prospective clients and you're trying to, you know, use email marketing in your business or even in a corporate setting where you're trying to convince your peers or your bosses of something, we need to know like how we can be more effective with our communication in that yeah. way. So can you share with us some like golden nuggets in terms Ooh, of our great approach segue. to email? <laughs> oh yeah. So I'm doing, I do email marketing and copywriting and it is a discipline. I've learned a lot. It's a discipline. I mean, it's an art, it's a science, whatever, but it, there are, there are things, there are guides out there and there are best practices. So um, when I was talking to Janine about what I do, I said like, even th- like a lot of these things apply to writing emails for business. And like writing to your boss, writing to coworkers. Because I remember working working corporate job, like you get so much email, you don't read, I mean, people don't read it. I had a boss who didn't read any email, <laughs> you know, even though he insisted we communicate with him that way. And so it was really hard to know like how to get your message to. And I've learned some things in email marketing that I wanted to share. So some secrets. So again, here we go. Like my number one thing is you have to think like your customer. That's how, so... That's something that I, you know, train my clients in as well. Like, stop thinking about what you want. Start thinking about what they want or what they, what's going on with them. You're just one email in a sea of emails in their inbox. So what catches, what matters to them? What catches their eye? You need to know stuff like that. So what's their issue? What's their, I heard this on the, uh, on another marketing Bushra Azar said this, what's their UTI? What's their burning problem their number one thing that like if you mention it or you say you have a solution to it they're going to jump up and down they really want that so think about that 
What, um, is the, what does the acronym stand for, UTI? Oh, UTI, yeah. urinary tract infection. I thought that was <laughs> universal. Like, what's their burn? That's like a thing. They can't sit down until they fix that. You know, like, what's their, or they can't, they can't move on until they fix that thing, right? That's like a really big, whatever their big problem is. So okay. if your email relates to that UTI, to use to be the metaphor to death, in any way, right? So like, let's say like, anyway, I mean, an example would be like, if you're, you know, you know, in my world with like, I worked a job that was very political in terms of like, there was tons of office politics. So if you could like show your boss that he can, I'm just saying, I'm just like trying to pick a realistic example. Mm -hmm. You could show your boss that he could like one up, you know, an, a, another guy that's like a lateral, a guy that's lateral to him in another department or something, or he could like show off or, you know, if that's kind of shit is really important to him that to, or her, but it's, you know, whatever, whatever, him or her, then put that in your subject line, right? You know, like, don't put like, you can one up, you know, Jane, <laughs> the name of the password. something that's yeah. going to like a nugget that's going to like, think about, just think like your customer. That's all I'm saying. Or think like the person that you're writing to. P like people always ask me how long a marketing email should be. So obviously I think in business, they should be shorter. But if you're trying to communicate something really important, no matter what, actually, an email, and I know this is going to be hard for people to hear, an email should have one thing that it's trying to get the reader to do. So in marketing, we call that a call to action. Mm -hmm. One call to action. So don't set, I, I really believe this applies in all email. Don't send an email where you're trying to get people to do two or three different things, remember different things, right? You know, make an appointment and also do something else. Like, Whatever you're trying to get them to do, the action should be at the bottom mm -hmm. and of a shorter, shortish email, bolded or bulleted out, and it should be one thing. So if you, I don't know, you know, that's hard sometimes, but yeah, you, if you can really think about only sending email when it's super necessary and only asking for one thing, that's, mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot more a lot more juice out of your emails. Another thing that I, I think really works well is, or something to think about. So there's types of subject lines. So yeah, but anyway, there's types of subject lines that work better than others, right? So if you're not thinking hard about your subject line, then there's room for improvement because people prioritize their inbox, like they're scanning, right? So especially if they get a lot of email. So in order to stand out, like I already mentioned, one thing would be like put in your subject line, you've solved some kind of problem for them, right? Something okay. is about to get easier. They are going to want to open that email, right? Another one I like, so here's the one. I mean, this is literally, you know, spark curiosity, right? You'll notice marketing emails, you might get a subject line that's like, this is the one way to add five thousand dollars a month to your income or something like that. That's mm -hmm. like a super marketing kind of like subject line that's sort of playing this game. You could think about, you know, is there a way to spark curiosity in your subject line? You know, is there like, oh, here's one I came up with. Like the subject line could be like, we finally got it. And mm. then they need to click to find out what the it is. <laughs> what is the it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, just think about like, is there ways to think, put things in the subject that they're like, well, God, I really need to know what that is now. Um, and it's fun, right? Yeah. The second way with subject lines is to make it urgent, right? So the, so include the name of a VIP in the subject line, if it relates to the VIP, like the, I'm thinking about this one job I had where the boss's 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 boss, you know, he was like so important. And so if I had, you know, if it related to him in any way, his name is Nodder, you know, Nodder needs X, Y, Z or not, or set, you know, this is for not, whatever, then my boss would have opened that email. So, okay. or you can just put action needed or we need a decision. I don't know. This is too many words, but like action needed by 5 PM or, you know, action needed yeah. by 2 PM, right? Like just, if it's really true, don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's really true email. that like, you know, <laughs> this cannot move forward until some, something happens, then you can put something like that. So yeah, other tricks that marketers use, and you'll if you look at your emails that you marketing emails you'll, you get, you'll see these patterns. Say something direct, like a really direct benefit. So, like, you know, what if they open this email? Some pro again, I guess I'm kind of covering the same base a different way. If they open this email, some kind of problem will get solved. What is going to get easier in their life if they open this email? Then they'll definitely open it, right? Yeah. And oh, the third 
The third um, kind of area I was going to cover is indifference, which I think is really interesting. And it's something I'm learning when I work with prospective clients or, you know, leads. Don't be too excited (laughs) because oddly, when you seem like too accommodating, you can meet at any time. You will email back right away, no matter what. And I know different office cultures are different, but people tend to deprioritize you because they know that they can always get you. So one thing I've started doing, because I, again, I watched something random on like forms.com, but it really struck, stuck with me was I stopped using exclamation points in my email or I use them really, really sparingly. So if I'm like, if somebody's making a request of me, like they want to make a meeting, and this is with like a lead, especially, I won't go, sure, exclamation point. I'll go, sure, comma, or sure, period. Uh, here's my, here's my count, you know, make an appointment with this link, or I have Tuesday at 4.15 open or whatever. But it's just like these little things. I think there's an overuse of exclamation points, especially by women. And it just makes think- it seem like we're really excited. We're really amped all the time. And it just kind of makes a lot of our communication less meaningful. What were you going to say? Um, no, I was just going to say it's really funny because I think it depends on how you view exclamation marks. So I remember when I was working as a corporate lawyer, my firm, I had a trainee in my team. No, actually she was a paralegal and um, she used to put exclamation marks in everything, like mm. every other sentence. And it, it actually got me annoyed. So I didn't think that she was enthusiastic. I felt like she was being sarcastic. Mm. Like it was almost like, yeah, I done that piece of work, exclamation mark. And um, can you let me know what to do next? Like to me, the tone was more like she's, I don't know. I just take it as more sarcasm as opposed to um, enthusiasm. And so if I saw emails with loads in, it really turned me off. I was just like, what is wrong with this girl? Like, who does she think she is? (laughs) Like, why is she doing this all over the email? (laughs) I was looking at, I did an audit of, just for myself, really, although I should do a video about this. I looked at all the Black Friday email I got, just looked in my inbox, looked in my promotions folder in Gmail, and just scrolled and looked at the different subject lines. And I got one that had four exclamation points in the subject line, like in a row, like, oh, wow, chance. And I was just like, at me. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, I'm not, I'm either going to open your email because I'm interested or I'm not, but four exclamation points is not going to be the thing that like makes me think like, oh, this is really urgent. Right. (laughs) It's like, either I want your thing, like I never wanted her thing because it's like a, it was like a product related to a newborn or something. And I I don't have a newborn anymore. You know, it's like one of those things. Yeah. Four exclamation points is not going to. So I just think like people don't think about what actually, again, what actually matters to a person yes. who want to open that. <laughs> it's not yeah. the amount of excitement you have about it. Like, so stop. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, that yeah. reminds me of, um, so just one other thing, just, um, you know, like when people write in capital letters in email, I also mm. feel like they're shouting at me. So mm. I, I think that it's important to think about your audience and think about like, is this the type of person that would take the way that I'm writing this in in the way that I don't intend it to be taken and then yeah. adjust accordingly. Because yeah, if someone caps for letters everywhere, I'm just like, what? They shouting. Yeah. So yeah. It's really interesting. It is. I mean, and this, so in this video I was watching about exclamation points, um, Barbara Corcoran was in it. She's like, oh, I don't know if you guys get the same TV we do, but she's on Shark Tank and she's sort of like this, you know, she's like one of these entrepreneurial celebrities or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you know, using it, when I get an email from a woman with a bunch of exclamation points, I feel like, this is what she said, I feel like that woman doesn't really think I'm going to give her the thing that she's asking for. Or, you know oh, what I mean? Ooh, yeah. And I was like, okay. Ooh. And I was mad because I was like, ugh, that's so sexist. But then I was like, well. <laughs> and then she, and she said, the other thing she said too, and if you'll notice, if anyone listening like communicates with a corporate bigwig who's a man, she was like, the the most powerful businessmen I communicate with by email, if I ever, if first of all, if they check it or if they ever do use email, they don't even use punctuation. Like, yes. and their emails are super short because they have that, they know you're going to listen. Like, because they know that they're important. And so like that sort of, and I, I mean, if you're not that important in your job or whatever, then don't, you know, pretend you are, but just kind of have that in mind that like what you say, what you write is, 
is should be strong enough on its own without caps, mm. like you said, or whatever, or, or exclamation points. So anyway, that's like kind of a thorny one. But I think there is in sales too, there's this idea of indifference. Like you can buy it, but if you don't buy it, there's other people out there yes. who need it and want it. So it's really, it's really up to you. This is what it is. Uh, and that kind of sell, the selling that way is I found more enticing. And so it's kind of the same thing in email. It's like, if you're, if you see more desperate for somebody to do thing, whatever the thing is, like mm. they're going to be more turned off. So anyway, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Oh, <sighs> awesome. So those are like, yeah amazing principles that we can start thinking about and thinking, okay, well, how can I, how can I apply this in my next communication by email? I hope so. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So one of the things I like to ask my guests for any words of advice that you would give to somebody who's a mum who maybe is thinking about transitioning into her own business or is at the stage where she's thinking about what, what the next steps are. Like now that you're looking back, do you have any like nuggets of wisdom that you can share on that point? Sure. I think it's really important to do things before you're ready. So just sell somebody something or what, I mean, that's the bottom line. Talk to people, pitch, you know, ha- like gather up some confidence from somewhere and make this like ask for the sale, whatever it is. Like, even if you're just thinking about a business, um, go see if you, there's clients out there. Doing things is way more important than planning even though planning is really fun and planning a lot, I guess maybe I do it wrong, but planning is, is good, right? You want to have, you definitely want to have a big goal in mind and like little mini goals for how to get there, but it never works out the way I plan it. You know, like Mm. a year never goes the way I think it's going to go. A lot of times things go better than I think they're going to go. Or, you know, I get it. I, a lot of times what happens is I get an opportunity because I'm doing stuff. That opportunity makes things go faster or leads it down a different path. So that's my number one piece of advice because when I first started, like I said, I was so afraid to do things and um, it made everything go really slowly. Yeah. <laughs> it was like nothing happened because I wasn't, I, w- I was like, well, oh, well, you know, I don't know. And I was looking for the perfect opportunity. I'm a perfectionist and you can't recognize the perfect opportunity. You, you won't see it. You just, so you have to do a lot of things and then mm-hmm. you'll, and then figure the, it out. Looking backwards, you'll be like, oh, that was a great opportunity. I'm so glad that I, I'm so glad I showed up at that event. I'm so glad I followed up with that person to call on the phone with them, whatever. And I think the other thing too, is like, just talk to as many people as possible. Like kind of, ha- I mean, it's good to have a strategy in mind or a time limit, you know, but like be doing informational interviews with people all the time, like other business women, um, people who are in your in your um, industry or niche, or you know, just talk to them without necessarily wanting to get anything from them, but just sort of ha- get a sense for just ask some questions, but don't don't expect them to like give you an opportunity or whatever. But I, I still, because I still, I'm pretty I'm pretty new at what I'm doing. I've only been doing email for two years, and so I, I talk to lots of people all the time just, and it always, it just coalesces, you know, it's like it, it, even if I don't have like a specific goal in mind, eventually like people will know people that like yeah. me to people that turn into clients, you know? And so, but if you're not talking to people, you never get those, you only have your own resources. Yes. So you need to, you need to talk to people. You need to be able to, uh, even the biggest introvert, you'll, they'll tell you people who have their own businesses that they, they do think that's really important. Yeah. I love the fact that you said you need to, you know, just start doing stuff. It's so easy to be in the planning mode all the time and feel like you're busy because you're planning and you're working on your website and you're doing all this stuff, but actually it's not moving anything forward. So I would definitely um, echo that you need to get out there, talk to people. And even if you're in corporate and you're saying, I want to move into a different role, a different direction, you also need to be talking to people and find out how they got to where they are, if that's where you want to get to. So I think the key is to look for other people who are where you want to be and and get talking and and networking. That's really important. Yeah. And like, yeah, talk to them. So um, Renee, this woman that Janine and I both work with, Um, she always says you need to identify the person you want to talk to. That's step one, but also kind of come up with an excuse or a reason. So like, um, yeah, it helps if you have, if you guys have a common interest, you notice that they, something, you know, they wear the same kind of earrings that you also, or not earrings is a bad example, but you know, they have some kind of, there's some kind of commonality and there's just like a way to talk or they both, you know, they have young kids and you have young kids or that's always a great way to 
you know, when you find that out and like, you're like, uh, oh yeah, I've got, you know, and it's like really great when they're really close in age, you know, I've got a 15 month old. Oh yeah. I've got an 18 month old. And then it's like, oh, is he walking? And then, yeah. you know, you get that in. So, um, yeah, look for those kind of things instead of like focusing on, oh, I really need to talk to them or I need something from them. Just focus on like, how can you start a conversation? Yeah. Uh, and then see where that goes. So that it's not so pressurized, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. Thank you. So yeah. thank you. I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, <laughs> so the other thing I'd like to ask people is to share an inspirational quote or a mantra or saying that you find useful. Cause I just love, um, that type of thing and I try and make note of new ones um and so I'd love for you to share if you have one I've got some here in my office I guess my favorite one is if it is to be it is up to me because <laughs> mm. it's very simple uh I love reading that one when I sit down every day like if the thing is gonna happen that's what you're just talking about I'm gonna have to do something so, I love yeah, <laughs> I love the way you say to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. I think that's, that's so important because sometimes we can think, you know, that saying uh, whatever will be, will be. And if it's mm. for me, no one can take it away and all that stuff. That There's part of that that's true, but you have to do. Like there, there's the element yeah. of you taking action as well. And so, yeah, I think that's awesome. Ah, oh, Maggie, it's been so good talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your golden nuggets. So now I'm going to go back and look at my email inbox and see how I can respond to people differently wonderful yay thank you so much for having me janine i really enjoyed it that's okay and if people want to find out more about what you do and um reach out to you where's the best place for them to find you <laughs> right so come to my website or instagram it's the same uh maggie frank hsu.com or maggie frank hsu on instagram that's where i'm there all the time um and you can also snag a freebie from me about all about email and just kind of check me out. <laughs> awesome. So I'll put the links to that in the show notes so people can check you out. I really appreciate your time today. It's been awesome chatting to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you. Did that interview just get you thinking that we need to be far more intentional about our email communication and communication in general it certainly did for me I think as women we are often taking more of the passive approach as opposed to active when it comes to moving towards what it is that we want and communicating with people that can help us to get to where we want to get to I thought it was really interesting what she said about how people in high positions especially men tend to use communication in a different way so they tend to have shorter emails they tend to speak in a different way women sometimes qualify what they say so they may say a statement and then afterwards say things like does that make sense or they might ask for permission to contribute their uh, what they want to say to a conversation and those things those small nuances can make a difference to how people perceive you and how people um, tend to treat your communication so it's worth just paying attention to some of those things are you showing up as someone who's assured and confident in what you're saying and what you're able to add to the conversation or to the email or are you um, coming at the situation or the conversation in a way where you you are feeling inferior but are you using words and are you communicating in a way that demonstrates that to the person that you're speaking to so just look at that check that that could make a huge difference to the results that you're getting in terms of where you're trying to go in your career if you're climbing the ladder or in your business and as you work with the clients on a day-to-day -day basis in addition to the really useful communication tips that Maggie shared with us, it was great to hear about her journey too and how even though she is someone who excelled academically that didn't necessarily mean she knew what direction she wanted to go in with her career and it took her some time some twists and some turns to get to where she is today where she's doing work that she enjoys and serving clients in a way that matches with her skill set but it really is challenging sometimes to figure out what is the next thing especially if you have become a mom and that has led to a change in values and perspectives and you're in a place where you're like I, do, I really don't know what it is I want to do if that's you then I invite you to download our career options guide which includes 17 career options that you may not have thought about post motherhood so you can grab that in the show notes as well as links to Maggie's website and her social media handles. So head over to lightboxcoaching.com forward slash episode 56 so you can grab all of those. 
If you are enjoying the Careers Beyond Motherhood podcast, can you do me a favour? Could you just take a few moments to leave us a rating and review? So however you're listening to this podcast in your podcast app, you can leave a rating or review or you can head over to iTunes and leave it there. Ratings and reviews help more people to find the show and join in the conversation. So I'd really appreciate if you take the time to leave us one. Okay, so that's all from me this week. I will speak to you again very soon. In the meantime, look after you and look after your babies. This podcast features music from Ben Sound.